Tanglewild Gardens a state of mind as much as a design, botanical, and daylily hybridizing adventure for Jeff Breitenstein and Scotty O'Mahony. The saying on the garage is Latin for life is beautiful. Life's been a lot of hard but satisfying work too, renovating a 1970s house and bland setting since 2013, two years after they traded Seattle for Austin. First thing we did is we fell in love with a Moroccan arch at a store and it was actually part of the structure of the store. I kept going back and then I took a photo of it and put it into the drawings when I was designing the house and um, showed him it and he's like, okay, you sold me. I'll sell you the Moroccan arches. So that's what started the whole sort of theme. The walls were next. We wanted to have an enclosed courtyard. The pool was already here, so two walls on either side of the pool to make that kind of enclosed courtyard. On the side that isn't walled, there's a large live oak tree, so it kind of creates a natural wall, and it gave us that nice little enclosed feeling. Moroccan tile inspired the intricate windows set into stucco walls. Basically, I created the pattern in a vector drawing program, and then we had the screens cut with a water jet. And they're steel, and they're um, powder coated. They lucked into the perfect gazebo to frame and shade one conversational cove. So a juggalo is typically in the central part of many homes in Southeast Asia. It's, I think, Javanese in terms, in, org, in origin. And then, so the that's sort of the central part of the house, and then they have rooms that sort of flank it. So initially, we were th considering building a juggalo home, um, but when we found this property, there was already a house on it, so we decided to just sort of transform the existing house. It was a brick house, and we got rid of the brick and put stucco on and sort of decided to go Moroccan instead, but we still loved the Jogolo, so when it came available, we couldn't pass it up. I did a Hanging Gardens of Babylon thing in fourth grade, sort of like a project, and so it just got me really interested in sort of like the Middle Eastern gardens and Turkish gardens and and so in studying them, I found that uh, a lot of traditional Persian gardens are actually designed for the evening because it's so hot during the day. They pocketed gathering spots to cool off even in Austin's heat waves. A spacious covered patio and dining area along the back of the house sports a ceiling made from the property's old fence. They chose powerful plants to stand out against the white walls, including tropical leafy texture and bold colors. And we hoped that with the walls it would be protected, so over the winter they wouldn't die back as far. And most of, most of the time it works pretty well. Another courtyard, dubbed the Moon or Paradise Garden, soothes with white or cream-colored flowers that catch the moonlight. In this intimate retreat, they stained wooden walls black to disappear against artwork and blossoms. On the former driveway, they framed a pathway to the back with wooden raised beds of hybridized daylily seedlings and a limestone planter clustered with figs and flowers. When we lived in Seattle, uh, the University of Washington has a lot of architectural detail at the top of their buildings, and they actually have a gargoyle tour. So we kind of fell in love with gargoyles from that and just started collecting them over time and we've, we've tucked them into parts of the garden. Around the corner, they promoted another ambience in dappled shade above the creek that trails along the back of the property. They turned the former carport into lounging and dining. It makes a nice place for people to gather and be able to look out over the creek uh, and see the back part of the property. There's a lot of mature trees back there. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's really a whole different feel from around the pool. It's more woods park-like. A path back to the courtyard attracts pollinators and hummingbirds in their certified backyard habitat. They enrich their caliche substrate with good soil and compost. And we designed the garden so that you could walk in a full circle around it. That particular area we figured would be a great place for just walking through and seeing the dailies flanked on both sides. It gets good sunlight, but it doesn't get the scorching heat all day. It has some shade. Daylilies are their passion. Now growing over a thousand cultivars, how do they get into these historic and diverse plants? My grandpa would, um, would basically go through the garden and, and with a salt shaker in his back pocket and pick a tomato, salt it, and eat it. Um, so I was a vegetable gardener. Um, and then when we were in Seattle, vegetables didn't do so great. Uh, the season wasn't long enough. So I kind of got bitten by the daylily bug and started growing flowers instead. But I've been growing daylilies since I was a kid. While in Seattle, Scotty got in touch with the Austin Daylily Society. I sent the president at the time a note saying, can you grow daylilies down there? I got more information from him than anyone else I'd ever like written to about daylilies. They just welcomed us like as if we've been part of the family since we first got there. Now active with the Austin Daylily Society, where Jeff served as president, they were recognized in 2017 by the American Daylily Society as an official display garden. 
Although May is peak daylily season in Central Texas, they grow cultivars that bloom from March to June, including repeat bloomers and seasonal surprises. There's actually daylilies in our garden here that are from my grandmother's mother uh, when they were living in Poland. And it's been bred into most of our seedlings because bringing in something that's older helps to strengthen the, the hybrid because as you hybridize and hybridize, it's, it's similar to dogs. You weaken the genetic structure of it. So by adding something that's closer to the species, it strengthens the, the future seedlings. The semi-evergreen or evergreen ones definitely have a better tolerance for the heat in Texas. They do best in morning sun, but we do have ones that have been successful in a more direct sun. It's nice to have a little bit of dappled light. We have definitely had a lot of daylilies just completely fry in full <laughs> sun. As far as dividing them, you don't really have to divide them. They don't divide them in nature, so it's not an absolute must. But um, to make them flower better, um, it's definitely good to, to divide them maybe every three years if they're clumping. They test hybridized seedlings in raised beds. There's tetraploid daylilies and diploids, and you can only cross uh, a tetraploid with a tetraploid. So by setting up the beds, we have one, one type in one bed, so it's easier to cross them. Um, they're also raised beds, so it's a little e easier on our back. We're hybridizing for daylilies that are more tolerant of this weather. So, so all our seedlings are in full out sun. So if it doesn't survive, it's, it's not it's something that we wanna <laughs> move forward with. I was fascinated by the fact that you could combine two things and get something completely different. Being a designer to begin with, it's almost like designing with mother nature. But the fun part of it is that, you know, mother nature always does some sort of a twist, you know, so you never know exactly what to expect out of it. One reason behind the daylily's everlasting fascination is its heirloom durability and countless forms, colors, and sizes. There's some that are six inches that only have one inch flowers. And some that are five feet tall. It's also great to just share it. Successful cross-pollination to style your own daylily results in seed pods. Jeff and Scotty start dried seeds in their gothic style kit greenhouse. Seedlings that I've grown, that I've bred, are growing in four continents from mm -hmm. friends that I've passed them on to. I don't have kids, but it's kind of like my offspring is like <laughs> gone out there in a different way, you know. People are growing them in Turkey and in England and in Australia, yeah. so, so it's kind of cool. We can actually use the flowers to eat. In most countries, they're actually a food crop. So it, when I was in Singapore, they had daylily ice cream. You can actually go to a, an Asian market and get a bag of dried buds um, and then just use those in your stir fry. Deeply inspired by plants and global experiences with Jeff, Scotty's taken his imaginative digital art online as custom designed Scotto Art. The main thing with our jobs is that we spend all day basically on a keyboard. Mm -hmm. So it's nice to come back to the garden and be able to get in the dirt and you know do something physical. You put in a new garden bed or you clean up a garden bed, at the end of the day you have a lot of satisfaction to look back at it and say, ah, I did that. Thank you.